Hi, this is Filmo Recap. Today we're going to recap a movie called Southbound, released 2015. But before we begin, don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell. When Dante started his journey from hell to heaven, he passed by a place named Purgatory. It's for the people not good enough for heaven or bad enough for hell. People there are tortured so they can go to heaven. The movie begins with the first story. Two men in the car and a man was looking at his daughter's picture because she died. While walking he notices a creature in the sky. It was looking strange like a skeleton. The man who saw the creature was named Mitch. His friend who was sitting with him was named Jack. Jack asks Mitch what are you looking outside? Mitch doesn't reply. He was thinking it's just his imagination that he saw. They reach a restaurant while driving. Jack moves to the washroom because his body was soaked in blood. Mitch is shown sitting in the restaurant and there was an earthquake. Everything was shaking and Mitch gets scared of the earthquake as he sees around everything was normal and feels there was an earthquake on his table only. Jack is shown in the washroom as he takes off his shirt to clean the blood. As the shirt comes to the face an unknown creature pushes him backward while holding his face. Jack gets scared of all this so he comes out while taking his friend Mitch. Getting out Mitch sees the same creature that is shown at the start of the movie. They were scared and were trying to escape. Every time they run, they come to a gas station. It seems like they aren't traveling because they reach the gas station each time indicting. They're in a time loop and a boy who is smoking is shown each time at the gas station. Mitch gets tired of all this. He was feeling they are trapped. He says to Jack we should accept our fate and we deserve this because we're stopping here no matter where we're going. Jack doesn't agree with him and insists on going forward. Mitch stops there as Jack moves forward. The creature appears in front of him. It was looking like a skeleton. It throws Jack out of the car while attacking his car. It badly ends him while stabbing its tentacles in his body. Mitch was seeing all this happening to his friend. He was scared that maybe the creature will attack him. The strange thing was the creature disappears and Mitch also runs from there. Moving forward he faces some other creatures. He moves into a hotel to escape. There were many rooms in the hotel and he finds his daughter inside the hotel. His daughter was asking him for help continuously and Mitch also wants to help her. As he moves forward, his daughter runs and he also runs behind her. The same gas station scene is happening here to him. It means that he returns to where he started. While moving forward he couldn't reach his daughter and Mitch was worried because of this. He was shouting while weeping. In the room, next door, Sadie, Ava, and Kim, who belong to a band called the White Tights, prepare for their next gig. During their road trip, they stop at famous landmarks to take pictures and have fun. Out of nowhere, a tire goes flat, forcing them to pull over on the highway. They try to contact friends for some help, but none of them are available at the moment. Even their phone GPS could not detect their location, putting them in a much more helpless state. Despite this, Kim remains in a good mood and says that they should share a drink instead while waiting for help. After hours of being stranded, a car eventually passes by. Inside are a friendly couple, Dale and Betty, who offers them a ride. Sadie politely declines and informs the couple that they are used to sleeping in their van. However, Dale and Betty are insistent on letting them ride by offering multiple solutions. Despite their friendly facade, the girls sense a different vibe and decide to stay. As the couple drives off, Kim has a change of heart and calls on Dale and Betty, claiming that they are their best chance of getting help. Along the way, the unlikely friend group gets to know each other. While in the back seat, Sadie spots a bear trap and asks Betty about it. According to Dale, they keep it there for coyotes. Finally, they arrive at the couple's home, and the girls are welcomed into the humble abode. Betty even leads them to a pleasant room where they could stay for as long as they want. Before Betty leaves them to stay cozy, Sadie hears her mention their late friend Alex, which she finds odd. Contrary to it, neither Kim nor Ava seems to notice what the woman said as they look around the room. Sadie raises her concerns about staying in the house, but the two persuade her to relax and have fun. Later that night, the Kensingtons, Raymond, Bunny, and their twin sons come over for dinner. Before their meal, they hold hands in prayer, but when Ava says amen, the family looks at her in disgust. They are served burnt roast beef on the table, but Sadie, a vegetarian, politely declines. She even finds it weird that Kim and Ava seem to enjoy their time with the strangers. After dinner, Ava prepares for a nice warm bath when a mysterious shadow passes behind her in the window. However, she does not notice it at all. Sadie finds a pocket knife inside a drawer in the room, but she tucks it in any way. She expresses her thoughts on being uncomfortable in the home and that they should be on the road to make it on time to their gig. Not long after, Kim starts to blame Sadie for Alex's death, saying that it was her fault. 
As she explains how she did not leave Alex on the night of her death, Kim begins to vomit a black substance, and so does Ava. Shocked by the sight of it, she runs to the living room to ask for help, but the families are untroubled by it. As she grins, Bunny tells them that the first time is the worst time. Dale finally gets up to pour a glass of white liquid medicine, which he lets Ava and Kim drink. The two girls drink the liquid in sync. Both act weirder as time passes, refusing to leave the house and the overly friendly couple. Despite Sadie's pleas, they remain unbothered, causing her to storm to the bathroom. Inside, she browses old pictures of the band and cries over Alex's death. Moments after, she returns to the room where she sees the twins standing still from the window. Sadie immediately closes the window and guards herself with the pocket knife she found earlier. She sits by the bed and eventually falls asleep. Sadie dreams about Alex asking her why she left her before getting killed in a car accident. When Sadie wakes up, Ava and Kim are gone. She peeks at the window and sees her friends following the two families around a bonfire as they participate in a cult ritual. While chanting, Betty, Dale, Bunny, and Raymond cut themselves and use their blood to draw a symbol on the girl's forehead. After a triangular symbol is drawn on them, Ava and Kim's eyes suddenly transform, just like the others. While watching the ritual from a nearby bush, Sadie's foot gets caught in the bear trap from earlier, causing her to let out a faint scream. The noise grabs everyone's attention, and her friends walk toward her. Ava and Kim creepily crawl in her direction, but Sadie manages to stop them from getting any closer. She unclamps herself from the trap and takes refuge in a small shed. Not long after, Alex's ghost emerges from the dark to scare Sadie off. Out of fear, she runs back to the highway in hopes that help will eventually come. Meanwhile, a man named Lucas drives along the highway while talking to his wife, Claire. He keeps looking at pictures of Claire, causing a great distraction on the road. Because of this, Lucas accidentally runs Sadie over in the middle of the pitch black road. Still in a state of shock, he decides to come down and see Sadie still clinging to dear life. Lucas calls 911 to ask for help with Sadie's critical injuries, but he is unable to tell the dispatcher where he is. Even his phone could not detect the location using the GPS, so the dispatcher connects him to emergency medical. In a matter of seconds, a certified EMT gets on the line to help Lucas out. The EMT demands him to describe Sadie's state right now and drive her to a nearby town. He abides by her orders and gets back on the road. After the long stretch of the nameless highway, he arrives at a local hospital in the heart of town. Lucas carries Sadie's body inside the facility and realizes that the hospital is completely abandoned. He continues to communicate with the EMT on the phone, who is utterly useless at the moment. Lucas checks the rooms for any signs of help but to no avail. After several empty rooms, he finally arrives at a surgery room where he could lay her down. Without knowing what to do, Lucas listens to the EMT instructing him to intubate Sadie. At this point, Sadie keeps twitching as her body loses more blood. Upon finding the intubating kit, he inserts the tube through her bloody mouth, struggling to find the right position. Out of nowhere, a third voice replaces that of the EMTS and claims that he is a professional surgeon. The voice makes Lucas reach into the poor girl's body to manually compress her lungs and keep her breathing. Afterward, the voice instructs him to make an incision just below her ribcage, which he follows out of desperation. Lucas reaches her lungs from the incision and compresses them, which kills Sadie instantly. Through his earphones, Lucas hears the voices laugh at him, and he hangs up quickly. He leaves the operating room but realizes that he is trapped as all doors are now locked. Realizing that he has been tricked into killing Sadie, he sits in the hallway of the abandoned building. Upon returning to retrieve his phone, Claire calls him, and to his surprise, it is not her who answers. The dispatchers from earlier persuade him to talk about the accident, but he says he does not deserve it. Surprisingly, they agree and tell him that he can leave the hospital. Moreover, they provide Lucas with access to new clothes and even a new car, so it will appear as though nothing happened. He hesitantly leaves, but the dispatchers assure him that he has nothing to worry about. Lucas drives away after hanging up the phone, and a woman named Sandy, who is actually the EMT, does the same. After saying goodbye to Lucas on the phone, Sandy walks to a nearby bar named Trap. The old and rundown bar is occupied by bar patrons including Warren and the bartender, Al. As Sandy orders a drink, Al reprimands her for leaving the door open, causing an argument to ensue. Warren backs Al up just as Danny barges inside with a shotgun, looking for his sister, Jessie. He holds Warren at gunpoint upon showing Jessie's picture to him, but is useless. 
While Danny questions Al about his tattoo, Warren appears to be a demon and transforms his hand. He strikes Danny from behind, causing a big wound on his back. However, Danny manages to knock Warren down and blows off his demonic hand. For the last time, Danny asks the patrons if they know Jesse's whereabouts, and Al says yes. This prompts Danny to take him hostage and make him drive through the long stretch of highway. Both of them arrive at the back door of an ice cream parlor, where Al claims Jesse is located. They enter through the secret doorway and see multiple men in a queue. Al then leads Danny to a room where he sees Jesse applying a tattoo on a patron's back. The siblings reunite and hold each other for the first time in 13 years. While they embrace, Al hits Danny on the knee, causing him to fall to the ground. The injured Danny begs Jesse to come home with him, but she refuses to. According to her, she is in that place by choice. In a fit of rage, Danny shoots Al, making him shriek in a demonic manner before Danny finishes him off. He kidnaps his sister and drives in the pitch black road while the locals, who are all demons, chase them. Jesse begs his big brother not to go off road, but he pays her no mind. Jesse reveals that she deserves to live in the horrible town after killing their parents. Her words leave Danny speechless and demons drag him out of the car not long after. Without any intentions to help, Jesse leaves him behind and drives back to the ice cream parlor. Jesse sees a rather friendly girl named Jim, who just got out of the bathroom by the secret entrance. Jesse shoos her away, and Jim meets back with her parents Kate and Daryl. Jim has a few days left before she embarks on her college life, hence the road trip to their vacation house. The family eventually arrives at the place and sees a pleasant living space. While Jim unpacks her stuff, Kate and Daryl prepare dinner in the kitchen. She overhears her parents talk about her going to college and if she really is ready. They hear knocks on the door and other corners of the house out of nowhere, but no one seems to be there. All three of them start to feel unsafe and uneasy, so Daryl instructs his wife to call the cops. As he peeks outside, he sees a masked man standing still just outside their place. When Daryl checks again, the man appears closer, causing him to be more frightened. The man repeatedly knocks more aggressively, so they decide to find an alternative exit. They pass through a glass door, but they go back in when two men block their escape. Inside, the lights go off and the shadows of the intruders are seen by the door. As they break in, Daryl, Kate, and Jim separate unintentionally. Kate and Daryl hide behind a table, but they get caught and knocked out by the masked men. On the other hand, Jim safely hides inside a closet and stays unnoticed. Back in the living area, the men confront Daryl, making him realize that he actually knows them. One of them whispers to Kate what her husband did, and she is astonished at Daryl's secret. He repeatedly says sorry to Kate, who is now being gagged mercilessly. Kate is sadly killed in front of Daryl. As he grieves, the car's lights and horn turned on, grabbing their attention. One of them goes out to check, but sees no one inside the car. As he walks back to the house, Jim stabs him from behind before taking the bat he holds. The two men confront her outside and order her to leave at that instant. Jim drives off on her own while the men stab Daryl to death. In his dying breath, they force him to look at Catherine's photograph and unmask themselves, appearing to be Mitch and Jack. Upon leaving the house, Jim hits them with a bat, fighting back for what they did to her parents. Jack chases her inside the house, but she manages to stab him with a wine opener. She gets a glimpse of her parents' corpses before she escapes, but Mitch kills her in the process. A tentacled creature comes out of Jim's body and her parents. As they try to flee, the third man gets dragged by a creature from beneath the ground. Mitch and Jack become slightly relieved after narrowly escaping death, but the creatures continue to chase and attack them. One even blocks their way, but Jack accelerates and runs it over. After, both of them agree to go back home as they drive through the nameless highway. With his bloody hands, Mitch clings to Catherine's photograph, immensely missing her. Mitch notices the creatures along the way out in the middle of nowhere, but he does not tell Jack. Once again, they end up at the same gas station where Sutter expects their arrival. The story interconnects the lives of the characters who drive on the same highway in the middle of nowhere. Each of them harbors dark secrets that they seem to run away from, causing their eternal suffering. Everything is a never-ending cycle of the worst day of the characters' lives, just as how hell is depicted. Their sufferings are consequences of actions they have done in their past life. The title Southbound parallels the direction of hell, which is down. No matter which route the characters take, all roads lead south, and that's it for today. Thanks for watching. See you soon and goodbye.